Well, what I want to talk to you about is the journey we had over the last five or so years trying to get rid ideally of our 10 years old monolith, but we haven't, who hasn't? Um, well, enjoy the story, yeah? So in 2013, we had very cool and secure in-house infrastructure, meaning that all our servers were hosted in-house in our offices, in several of them. Uh, we did have cloud-based servers and like AWS instances for our websites or customer-facing products generally. Uh, well, we were not so good about monitoring that stuff, so if you know something is broken, that's probably when the customer comes to you or you have to go into server room and look at where whatever is broken. Well, log analysis is, was also kind of challenging, so if you want to look at log files, you have to like log into servers, look at them, and do whatever is required to know. Um, we used Jenkins at that time, and for some reason we did have uh, automated builds, but no automated deployments at all. Although we were running just four products at that time, which, well, four monolith, which were talking to each other in some form. Uh, it wasn't that a hassle to deploy these four products, but, you know, even at that time, some of them were running in uh, multi-instance environments, so that was challenging for engineers at that time, and that was just five years ago. Well, now we have it all like in AWS, it's all running in containers, uh, it's all covered with centralized logging, tracing, um, monitoring, CI and CD for some products, and we run over 50 products in total. Uh, well, number of containers is like about <coughs> overall. Um, well, coming there was challenging. It was challenging for people, it was challenging for systems we designed, uh, it was interesting for products we left behind. And what I want to talk about is how we managed to transform all of it, mostly all of it, into what we have these days. So, first of all, we had to look at the culture because uh, our business was very used to deploying uh, these four products on some cycles like every month, three months, some of them even more than three months. Um, we had to look at how we design our products because you, well, it's not going to work if you just say, okay, let's go to microservices because everyone's doing it. Let's go and get some hack, you know. No, it's not going to work like this. Um, then when we discussed the way we're going to build our systems, um, well, you can't start building microservices without having a proper platform when you where you deploy them and looking at how you deploy monitor and whatever you do to run those services. And the biggest challenge probably these days is what do you do about uh, all the legacy stuff you have? How do you migrate those microservices? How do you migrate those functionalities actually out of that monolithic product into microservices? So first of all, we had to reduce chaos we had in engineering. Uh, we stopped the incoming flow at some point. So that was very painful, that was great cultural challenge for the business. We literally asked people not to come to us with their problems. And that was some people were really furious because they used to like uh, for their questions come to those specific people in, in our team to solve their problems. Uh, doing that alone actually like increased performance of the team dramatically. Uh, well, that something just has to do with how you manage your work and how you get, uh, basically, how you manage upstream and downstream of your work. Reducing incoming tasks generally allows you to, to decrease the number of tasks you have in progress. And then you can start looking, for example, at Kanban and just limit the uh, amount of work in progress you have. Um, well, everyone here probably used some kind of not even ticketing system, but uh, 
task manager, generally. And, well, we did have those as well, like first tasks were as, you know, I think like almost 10 years old probably. And, but we didn't ever have a system to accept uh, internal requests from internal customers, meaning that the culture of coming to favorite IT people was created by not having a system to track all those requests. And stopping this coming way of doing things together with uh, let's not send emails, let's just log it into the ticketing system was the way we managed to organize and unify the flow of incoming tasks. Um, pretty simple as it sounds, but again, it's a cultural change. It's very painful and it creates some, let's say, behavioral problems. Um, well, change management and how to make people aware of what you deploy, because uh, when you have a small team, you tend to just do your job and you want to deploy as many times a day as you want. Um, in our environment, the challenge was to set up a process where we can do a lot of changes, but at the same time make our customers, internal customers and external customers, aware of what we do. And the idea was to create a system where we can essentially track all the changes we make record them and notify our customers of what we do. Uh, we automated this thing so it runs on top of our Jira and creates uh, system and creates personalized emails for customers telling them that you know your team department requested those things from us and that's what we've done for you over the last like, day, week, month. And the same happens when it goes live, so they receive a notification like, you know, those things went live. Same goes for feedback loop. So once we send those emails telling people that, you know, your stuff is ready, it's there, then we can collect feedback and send them uh, like a server or something, asking like, you know, that's what we've deployed. Are you happy, not happy? Do you want us to change something? Automating this gave us feedback and then we had to address, okay, but how do we manage when something goes wrong? So then when we look at, okay, how at the process of how do we record those problems, how do we communicate those outages or different deployment problems to people? All of this is kind of, it's not, you know, it's not a rocket science to do, but not having this create some unnecessary and unplanned work you have to do because you just you don't have it. And then after you have uh, managed upstream, so you can receive all your tasks into some system and you can categorize them or whatever, then when you can limit the amount of work you do, then you can iterate it and you can get feedback and then you can actually move faster. And only by doing all these we managed to, well, to start moving a lot faster than we were before. Well, let's talk about Docker just a bit. Well, we all know that it allows us to run infrastructure as a code. Uh, for us, the biggest achievement was to unify our environments because we have quite a lot of technologies running for quite a few people, quite a few engineers meaning that everyone had to run their own version of, I don't know, PHP, Java, Node, then it was covered by Selenium tests, and then you can have to get all of this stuff and running, onboarding new engineers as well, and whatever problems. Um, so unified environments allow us to onboard engineers faster and to Built fast because we started using um, basically unified Docker environments as prototypes for our build environments as well. Well, and works on my machine that still to be honest a bit of a challenge, but 
using Docker obviously allows you to just wrap it all around and no engineer can ever say that the old works here but not there, usually, unfortunately. Well, it's debugging uh, for some things like wrapping PHP to debug where you have remote debugger, wrapping it up on Docker allows you again to <coughs> reduce time you need to set it all up. Well, and what we have come through when we tried to introduce DevOps culture on that scale we had was that everyone thinks of DevOps as some kind of person doing something for them and changing that culture to be DevOps culture rather than a DevOps engineer, you know, that, that title still exists and quite a lot of people use it, so DevOps is not a job title and that's one of the main things to tell everyone. And it's not operations team telling engineers to do it yourself. You know, here is your production access, go and do it. Enjoy it. Well, that was part one probably when we fixed things. That's when the decision was made to try and migrate from that very big old product we have, which in banking called like core application, which is an application which runs all our like CRM accountancy, where financial business, so we do trading, we do payments, and all these workflows tied up into one big analytic product. So for us, the idea was, okay, how can we split this and start doing it smaller so we can get this responsibility aware of this big product. And, well, we decided to try it and we started with our first microservice and to see how we can move from there. So we built what we call version zero. That was, that was one service which we built initially just as API product, so we did some REST requests, basically served some REST requests. It was covered by our first version of Monitor at that time. Now we have like third, I think. And I mean, third is a stack of technologies, and not as a like iterated, just different stack. And uh, it was plugged into our core application, and it replaced some of bits and some functionality in our core app. But it was deployed traditionally, meaning uh, it was uploaded as an artifact into some servers via some automation tools. It was unpacked there and it did run. And it was written in PHP. Uh, to be honest, PHP itself was probably one of the biggest, I don't want to say mistakes, but it was one of the biggest challenging challenges going into microservices world with PHP. Well, I don't want <laughs> to get into details why it happened. So, we were on the way to our bright future. We said, let's go for Golang because it was pretty easy to migrate for engineers. We had, uh, and most of them were PHP engineers. It was this compiled language meaning that we, we don't have quite a lot of problems we have with PHP when it goes to production, <coughs> then you discover some runtime things, which you don't become very test and well go routines it was quite a big advantage as well. Well that's not all the decision making process but generally. So the challenges we had were okay how do we scale this up? How do we get this version zero microservice we built and how we scaled so we can just shut down this old monolith, which is now actually 10 years old. So we had to maintain stability, that was our first goal. How can we migrate without actually causing any more problems and outages? We were so happy to, to get out of those woods, you know, where we where we caused some problems with our deployments and automation and 
manual things we did. So going to this next adventure into microservices world was a bit challenging for us as a team because, well, we were expecting troubles because we were touching something which is quite old and big, generally speaking. Uh, then we looked, okay, how do we make it secure because that's a quite common concern for microservices infrastructures. If you do it wrong, then you can just open it up to everyone, you know. One of the main goals why I wanted to do microservices was for us to start moving even faster than we were. So once we solved all the organizational problems, we looked at how can we solve technical problems we had because of that monolithic system and because of lack of properly automated infrastructure and how can we start moving even faster by having microservices. At the same time, we spent too much resource actually managing microservices platform. And how can we support innovation? Because moving faster and allow people to experiment having something which you build for, let's say, hours and then you deploy for tens of minutes or, again, hours, it's not something where you really want to allow people to break it in their own time in production and see how, people, how your users will react to this, you know? Doing these things with microservices usually is a lot easier because you can just experiment. And again, you can dispose of them and just try the new ones if you're unhappy. So we had to honor this legacy product we had. How can we minimize incidents? We had to look at how can we plan shutdown of this product or all of the servers we had in traditional EC2 infrastructure and to reduce cost because driving two infrastructures in parallel is, is a cost to the business. And how can we, that's the system design thing, how can we actually replace all those bits of uh, monolith products with microservices, again, without causing outages, without causing coding inconsistencies so breaking some business logic. Even if it does work, there is no like outage in mean, IT way, you know, if you make some just business logic error, that's it, your customers get, well, I don't know, unscheduled payment to their account. So, the biggest question I usually have about our system is why Swarm? Why aren't you Kubernetes guys? Well, for us, the thing was that we started even not from the current swarm, but from the one which is called Legacy Swarm right now, which was a swarm on top of Docker, where it was set up kind of Kubernetes way, where you had all these additional containers managing the cluster. And, well, it seemed to be quite logical to migrate from that system further when swarm was out. Plus, we are small team and for us not having a dedicated team of engineers to work with Kubernetes and do all of that stuff we want to do and make all those decisions and experiments we have to do with Kubernetes if you want to do it right, well Swarm seems to be quite a good choice for small teams. But there are some things missing in Swarm, like we don't have scheduler where we can schedule tasks. I'm going to talk about this a bit later, so we have to write it. You can't there is no job runner, so you can't really like run your containers or stack of stacks of containers easily. And there was no config or secret management at that time when it was launched as well. But anyway, there was built-in service discovery, there was networking, uh, volumes were supported, and there was orchestration with Compose, so it was actually quite easy migration for us when, because we all we already had all these Compose files recently. <clears throat> and it was a quick start, really. And then we started building. And what we built was a microservice framework, which we called Goblin, and it solves quite a few tasks for us, making it like a just proper microservice framework. Um, so we have like model management there, so if we want to run several 
let's say, also autonomous part of application, still living as a microservice, we can just like declare a module and write bootstrap and shut down functions for it. We're just gonna like start and stop together with the application and react on all those uh, signals from Docker, for example. Uh, we do config management, so we can uh, define all this in YAML, we can define environments, uh, overrides, and quite a lot of cool stuff. Uh, we manage storage and databases, SQL and non-SQL, different types of cache, transport as HTTP server based on Jin, uh, HTTP client, and WebSocket router, which gives us basically more or less same routing capabilities as Jin, but via WebSockets. And the main idea why we actually got into this was to, to do it heavily monitored. So it all has monitoring metrics going into Influx the what we use. Uh, it has WebSocket router covered and go run timing and we take things like go routines and just monitor them as well as part of health checks. Uh, so it's all locked uh, in a way that we, for example, can get context data and automatically store all the customer related information or session related information on swaps. Um, it's integrated with like Sentry and we do health checks as well. Uh, and it is heavily covered with tracing, all, like almost all of it covered with tracing. So health checks, for example, we have as metrics, meaning that we push them to InfluxDB. Uh, health check themselves are supported, but with Docker, we expose them as metrics as well, so we can use them in the future, for example, if we want to use Prometheus. And, and we visualize them in a way that, like, it's Grafana, yeah, so you can just see timestamps of all those outages and health checks failed on your dashboards. Well, and we love tracing. We literally try to trace as much as we can, like all the HTTP calls we have between microservices or WebSocket calls. We trace not just incoming calls, but outgoing calls to our services, all to third party APIs. Uh, even SQL queries, we can trace that, you know, there was this SQL query made to that database or no SQL query. We can do and inject traces into message queues and monitor basically our workers processing messages after the event or generally events or even emails we can trace and see that email goes out and then it comes back as a result um, and obviously because it's swarm then you have to build quite a lot of stuff yourself so there is some self-deployment system which deploys the cluster itself all the monitoring ci and all the stuff. Then there is some GitHub so we can store cluster state like you have it. Uh, you can have it with Kubernetes, for example. Then um, there is secret management also built on top of KMS and Thread Stash, but as a microservice. Then we do have a thing which can broadcast some events across, like one instance of. Uh, service and notify all containers within a service about some of that. Single sign-on and uh, identity management, schedule and job runner, that's what you have to build as well just because you don't have one. Uh, because we are FCA regulated, then we have to do change on it, so every change happening to any of our infrastructure database has to be logged. Email delivery thing. And, Monitoring, which in our case it's in Flight Grafana, Slack, and we have some TV dashboards. For that, we also have a separate product. Well, it's in the background, unfortunately, it's a bit blurred for some reasons. So, all these dots, these are containers, and they are all live connected to Docker API, so you can actually see when your containers are up and down, deployed, have some problems like these big, big red circles. Well, yeah. So we connected to Telegraph, which is a metric collection system. We push them to Influx and define now which metrics we want to use, and then just display them on dashboards. Well, that's it. 
Thank you. Work. So, maybe we have a question for Igor. I thought for a moment, so well, I, I, think, I think, I think, crack, no problem. Uh, any information about the automated, automation testing or something like that? Because I didn't hear. I, I have sources in my head. Sorry, I can't tell you. Okay. <laughs> testing automation. What's my place? Well, there is testing automation, but several layers of it. Uh, the, probably the one I can talk about is the one we have which tests workflows around microservices. So basically it hits, let's say, an entry point to the, like of some front end and then tests the whole workflow hitting all microservices within the system. But for that we have to bring up quite a few microservices to test some chains, you know. Plus there are uh, traditional tests like unit tests for some projects, there are integration tests. It kind of depends on the project to be honest. Okay, cool. Any other questions? Yeah, one more at the back. Hang on a sec. Um, I'm curious about how you did the tracing injection. So um, you mentioned that you could actually trace queues. So that's something I've been looking at kind of recently. All messages we send that to all messages. So when we so we have a wrapper around, we use AWS SQS for all queues. So when we we wrap basically a, like a we call the pusher a basically a service which sends SQS messages. So they are with JSON and we just inject trace ID into SQS messages. On the other side, we have our own implementation of uh, SQS workers. So the things which pull from queues. So they basically that get get that trace ID creator span and just resume the trace. Okay, any other questions for Igor? Going once, going twice. So, Igor, thank you very much. Thank you.